What's up, guys? I am here to recap UFC 294, which went down live from Abu Dhabi yesterday on Saturday, October 21st. Now, it was a pretty good card, especially, you know, toward the main card and getting closer to the main card. It uh, started to come alive a little bit. There were a couple controversial outcomes, unfortunately, but... um. Yeah, I guess let's get into it. Our first fight came between Sharaputin Magomedov, who was making his UFC debut. Finally, I was so happy to see this. And uh, Bruno Silva. Now, there was... It was hard for the UFC to sign Sharaputin Magomedov because he doesn't have, like, any eyesight in one of his eyes. It's, like, completely dead. So the commissions would not allow him to fight. However, getting him on an Abu Dhabi card, they don't have a commission. So they were able to sign him. And his opponent that he got for his first UFC fight couldn't have been better. Um, Sharaputin came over with a record of 11 and 0. 10 of those wins were knockouts. And he was fighting Bruno Silva, who was 23 and 9. 20 of those 23 wins came via knockout. Um, Magomedov got the unanimous decision win. I don't agree with the scorecards with this fight at all. He got a clean sweep on the cards 30 27. A universal 30-27, all three judges. And I don't understand that because he won the first round. He won the first half of the second round. And then he got taken down literally midway through it and couldn't get back up. And then he got out-wrestled for the entire third round, pretty much. So the fight could have gone either way. Like, either way you score it, 29-28, I wouldn't disagree with. But giving Shara Putin and Magomedov all three rounds in that fight, he – it dude – that was as close to a scenario of winning the first half of the fight and losing the second half of the fight as you'll ever have. That's exactly what happened. He won the first half, lost the second half. Lost 50% of it, won 50% of it. That's it. How does he get a how does he get 30-27s on all three fucking judges' cards? It didn't make sense. I am not gonna disagree with him winning. I'm glad he won. He's still undefeated. Um, he didn't look terrible. Um He's a technical striker. He's a dangerous dude. Now he's 12 and 0 with 10 knockouts. Um Bruno Silva though, he came to the UFC let's see. In June of 2021, he hadn't fought in nearly 3 years at that point. Okay, his last two wins however came over Alexander Shemenko, former Bellator middleweight champion, and Artem Frolov, the M1 challenge middleweight champion both of which he knocked out and he claimed the M1 title, then took a two and a half year hiatus before coming to the UFC, get rattled off three straight knockouts. Now, then they gave him Alex Pereira and Gerald Mearshar, both of which beat him. He knocked out Brad Tavares, then lost to Brennan Allen and Shara put in Magomedov. So what I'm trying to get at with this is the only two people that weren't able to finish Bruno Silva in his losses were Alex Pereira and Shara Putin and Magomedov, both former kickboxers. If And all of his losses prior, aside from one disqualification, which I would consider a no contest rather than a loss, all seven losses are submissions. This dude hardly ever loses stand-up fights. The only two times he has lost a stand-up fight, he didn't get knocked out. I just thought that was an interesting fact and kind of impressive, honestly. Um... It's kind of crazy that Shara Putin, Magomedov, and Alex Pereira are the only two guys that have ever fucking turned Bruno Silva into a wrestler. That's like when Michael Page turned Paul Daly into a wrestler. Did anyone fucking see that coming? All right. Anyway, let's get on to the third fight. Muhammad Naimov and Nathaniel Wood. This was a good fight. It looked a lot like Nathaniel Wood's last fight with Andre Feely, honestly. Not quite, but... It was pretty close. They both cracked each other. They both dropped each other. And other than that, it was kind of a wrestle fest with Naimov getting the better of it in two out of three rounds. Now, Naimov made his UFC debut up at 155 pounds, knocking out Jamie Malarkey earlier this year. Um, and Nathaniel Wood was coming up from 135. He had gone 3-0 at featherweight so far, and this was his first loss at 145 pounds. Now, I thought Nathaniel Wood was going to beat him. I was pretty impressed with Muhammad Naimov in this fight, not going to lie. He improves to 10-2 and two as a pro, and Nathaniel Wood falls to, I think, 20-6. and six. Yep, 20-6. and six. All right. Go on to Mark Braden and Anshul Jubilee. 
No one expected this to happen. I'll fucking tell you that. Mike Breeden came into this fight. First off, he missed weight. I'd just like to say a lot. He missed weight by three and a half pounds. Um, but he was 0-3 in the UFC coming into this fight. He was 10-6 and 6 as a pro, whereas Anshul Jubilee was 7-0 and 0 as a pro. He won the Road to UFC Season 1 lightweight tournament in his previous fight, in his UFC debut. He got a second-round knockout. Everyone was everyone was expecting Jubilee to run right through Breeden, and he was through the first two rounds. His striking was slick. It was technical. He looked good. And then Breeden comes out and starts barking at him and yelling at him in the third, and he starts piecing him up. Excuse me. And you think all Jubilee needs to do is survive. All he needs to do is survive. But three minutes in, he gets sat down with, the, I think it was a right hand, a really hard right hand. And, um, yeah, he suffers his first career defeat. Now, Jubilee is 28, and Breeden is 34. So, they're both grown men, okay? But I think that Jubilee suffered a little bit from getting discouraged in that third round, knowing that Breeden was still there, someone that was 0-3 in the UFC, that had been knocked out twice in two, in two of those three fights. And... um. Yeah, he knew he wasn't getting him out of there and that Breeden had more fight left in him in that third round and a little over midway through it, he suffers the first defeat of his career. He'll be back. He's a very good Indian prospect. Mm, Cedriquez Dumas and Abu Zaitar. Dumas did pretty well in the first round, out wrestling him. He barely lost the second round. And then the third, he outstruck Azaitar for a 29-28 uh, win. He he looked okay. Abu Azaitar is only his third UFC fight in like five years. Um, yeah, not really too much to say about that one. Yabid Basharat and Victor Henry, this had a really upsetting outcome. Victor Henry got his nuts kicked literally up into his fucking throat. And... Throughout the entire five minutes that he was trying to recover, that doctor was telling them that he was fine and he should be able to fight. And I'll be honest, I have been watching MMA since 2009, since January 2009. I've seen every fight on every WEC card and every fight on every UFC card since then. I have never seen someone react quite like that to a low kick. And that doctor is such a fucking ignoramus moron for thinking Henry should have just got up and kept fighting. He had to go to the hospital and get a testicular ultrasound. Okay. And this doctor thought he was fine to continue the entire five minutes. He was trying to recover. No less. He had to end up stopping the fight. It's a no contest. Um, yeah, you'll hear more about that doctor in a few minutes. Trevor peak and Muhammad Yahya. It wasn't a great fight, but it was an okay fight. Trevor peak imposed as well. he, he had the cage control. He had the heavy-handed boxing. I would have liked to have seen him go to the body a little bit more. He did in the third round, but I would have liked to see him go to the body a little bit more because it would have opened up Yaya's face a little better. Um, Peak was 8-1 and one as a pro coming in, all eight wins by knockout. But he got a unanimous decision win. He looked good. Um, Muhammad Makayev and Tim Elliott. A lot of people wouldn't say this was a good fight. I was happy with it, though. Elliot was doing very well early on. He stuffed Makayev's first two or three takedown attempts pretty handily and ended up taking Makayev down himself. And then Makayev ends up getting Elliot down and gets locked in a guillotine, which he gets out of. And he remains on top until the end of the first round. In the second round, the same thing happened. He got locked in a guillotine as he was as he was taking Elliot down. And this one was a lot closer to, uh, this one was a lot tighter, this guillotine attempt. But again, he gets out of it, remains on top until the end of the round. Now, Elliot locks up a triangle choke at some point. I don't remember if it was in the second or third round, but Makayev slams his way out of it. And he's so lucky that when he slammed Elliot that he dumped him on his head. Because if he dumped him on his back, it might have just sunk the choke in even tighter. And he gets out of it. He eventually gets the arm triangle choke. Uh, finished three minutes and three seconds into round three. Now, Muhammad Makayev is starting to be like 
the Ben Henderson or the Alexander Volkanovsky of 125 pounds in the sense that he's just unsubmittable. Now, obviously, Ben Henderson was eventually submitted by Anthony Pettis and then Usman or Magomedov later, way later on. But, dude, he was stuck in a really deep knee bar. I think it was his last fight with Fialo or Fialo, Jeff Al Fialo. Um, no less, Muhammad Makayev, 23-0 and as an amateur, 11-0 and as a pro with eight finishes. He's only 23 years old, dude. And his last three wins, he's also kind of like the Brian Ortega or the Max Holloway or the Yoel Romero of flyweight division in the sense this is his third straight, third round finish. All three third round finishes by submission. And this dude has such a wide array of submissions too. He's got rear naked chokes. He's got guillotine chokes. And then his last three fights, he... Submitted, well, let's just go through his UFC career, shall we? Cody Durden, he submitted in 58 seconds with a guillotine choke. Durden has gone on to win his last four straight since losing to Mikhaev. He beat Charles Johnson by unanimous decision. And then his last three wins, all third-round finishes, he armbarred Malcolm Gordon at 426 of round three. He neck-cranked Jafal Filo at 432 of round three. And then he just arm triangle choked Tim Elliott at 303 of round three. I am still just as high on him as ever. Even he lost this fight to Tim Elliott. I still think he's going to be a future champion. But now that he won, like, who's going to beat this kid? They're building him correctly. They're giving him the time. They're giving him enough fights that aren't the top, top guys. Tim Elliott's definitely the best fighter he's fought so far. And, yeah, he passed with flying fucking colors, man. I can't wait to see Mikhaev's future. He, dude, he's a future champ, probably a future longtime champ. Um, Syed Nurmagomedov got back to his winning ways to open up the main card, submitting Mew and Gafarov with a ninja choke 73 seconds into the first round. Now, Nurmagomedov was coming in off a loss to Jonathan Martinez, and honestly, a fight that I thought he was going to get the nod in. It was close, but I thought he won that fight. Um, going into that fight, he was on a four-fight win streak, so that makes him 5-1 and one in his last six with four finishes. Two of them were in under a minute, and this one was just over a minute long. He's now 18-3 and three as a pro. He's probably the best Bantamweight in the UFC that isn't ranked right now. Um, again, I'm excited to see what he brings in the near future, especially at 31 years old. Give this dude some top guys. You know what? I'd like to see the Jonathan Martinez rematch, to be honest, because I think he could beat him. Um. But no less, let's get to the first feature fight of the night. Ekrom Alaskarov and Warley Alves. Man, Warley Alves was a late replacement for Nasser Dinamavov, the number 11 ranked middleweight. And I think we all knew it was going to happen in this fight. But because after opening up his career with a 10 0 record, Warley Alves had since gone 4 and 6. And now he's since gone 4 and 7, getting finished in four of those losses. But Warley Alves is a tough three Brazil winner. He went 3-0 and on the show with two finishes. And going into his UFC debut, he was 6-0. and He climbed to 10-0. and So he was 4-0 and in the UFC with three guillotine choke submission victories, the last of which came over Colby Covington. He broke his rib with a body kick and sunk in a guillotine choke just 80. 86 seconds into the first round. He's the first person to ever defeat Colby Covington, and he's the only person not named Kamaru Usman to ever defeat Colby Covington. That's probably his biggest uh, cling to fame. He was a very, very dangerous prospect at one time. But Ikram Alaskarov, we could tell it's his time. He's now on a seven-fight win streak. He's 2-0 and in the UFC with two first-round knockouts. He knocked out former kickboxer Phil Hawes in his debut earlier this year in May. Followed it up with a flying knee knockout over Warley Alves. And what's more, three of his last seven wins come by a Kimura finish. I really want to see him get a Kimura in the UFC. I want to see him get a couple of them, actually, because I you don't see him very often. I love seeing fights get finished with those. But nonetheless, his only loss is to Hamzat Shemaev. He, he's 15-1 and one as a pro. Only ever lost to Hamzat. That, that should say something about this kid's potential. And then the feature fight of the evening, 
Mah or Magomed and Goliath and Johnny Walker. Man, this result could not have pissed me off much more. The only thing I would rather had not seen is Johnny Walker knock him out. Now, I was really nervous going into this fight because I love Muhammad, or Jesus Christ, Magomed Ankalaev. In my opinion, he should be the UFC light heavyweight champion. I think he beat Jan Blahovich. I think that draw was kind of atrocious. I thought he won the first, fourth, and fifth rounds against uh, Blah Blahovich. But going into this fight, I was worried that it was going to be a Gegard Mousasi, Uriah Hall type situation. We all knew Gegard was a top three guy at that time, and Uriah Hall caught him with a spinning back kick and flying knee and knocked him out. I was really worried about that because I do think Ankle Ive is the best light heavyweight in the world, but Johnny Walker is perhaps the most dangerous matchup for him at, a, at 205 pounds because Johnny Walker is just flashy and fucking dangerous. He hits hard with his right hand. He hits hard with his left hand. He... Is very well versed with his knees and kicks and elbows. He knocked out Khalil fucking Rontree with a series of elbows from the clinch in his debut. This was a dangerous matchup. And Muhammad and Ankalaev looked incredible in this fight. He caught Johnny Walker with a punch to the body that hurt him. But maybe Walker was playing possum because as Ankalaev charged in, he threw a flying knee, which he missed and ended up getting taken down along the fence. Now, Angoliath was mauling him from here, but throws a knee to his face, and the fight is stopped. I think we all knew Johnny Walker was okay to continue. He didn't even look that rattled. The doctor stopped this fight, and it was a no contest. Now, the doctor asked him if he knew where he was, and he said in the desert, which isn't exactly wrong. They, they're in a fucking desert. They're in Abu Dhabi. And he stopped the fight because of it. Now, going following Mah Magomed and Goliath's last fight with Jan Blachowicz, I wondered if he was going to have motivation issues, kind of like, say, Johnny Hendricks, who lost two very disputed split decisions to Georgia St. Pierre and Robbie Lawler in title fights. His motivation just fell off a fucking cliff after that. After not walking away from two UFC 282 with the belt, I was really worried that, you know, his motivation wouldn't quite be the same because I've seen it happen to other guys. He looked great in this fight, but again, he walks away without a win. Two fights in a row now, he walks away without a win. He's 18-1, 1-1-as a pro. And honestly, dude, Ankoliev could easily be 21-0. His only loss came to Paul Craig in the very last second of the third round of a fight he was winning every single second of. And then the only other two blemishes, Jan Blahovic, a decision 90% of the MMA fan base thought he won. And then Johnny Walker, a fight he was winning, but it was stopped from an illegal knee. And at least he wasn't disqualified. But that doctor should never, ever be an official of another fight again. Certainly not another. Certainly not a doctor of a fight in a big organization one championship pfl bellator ufc ryzen fuck that dude do not employ him like that was a that was atrocious and johnny walker was ready to keep going he tried to fight ankle high of right after the fight was stopped it almost turned into a brawl and i was like yeah restart the fight dude restart the fight like they're both ready i knew it wasn't gonna happen because once the fight is stopped like, you know, the official calls it off, the ref calls it off. They can't be restarted. And that was very upsetting to see. Who the fuck knows what's next for Magomed Ankle Live after this? I don't even know. Hopefully, I mean, I, it'd be cool to see the rematch, but really, I don't know, man. Let's take a look at the light heavyweight rankings, actually, and see what some potential matchups could be. All right, Yuri Prohaska is fighting Alex Pereira at the next pay-per-view for the light heavyweight belt. Inkoliev is right behind Yuri, right ahead of Pereira. Jan Blahovich, I guess you could do that rematch. Alexander Rakic, he hasn't fought in forever. Nikita Krylov, who I believe Inkoliev has already beat. 
yeah, he already beat Krylov. And then Walker is below Krylov even. Yeah, dude, like, I don't know who the fuck they're going to give him next. Hopefully they get him in there quickly, though. I don't want him to sit out for another year after two very controversial asterisk, asterisk dense blemishes. Just, man, I really didn't like the result of that fight. I really didn't like the result of his fight with Lohovic. Hopefully he gets back in there soon. Kamaru Usman and Hamzat Shemaev. This wasn't an absolutely great fight, but Hamzat looked pretty good. And again, just like in the first fight of the night, I didn't really agree with the judging in this fight. Now, one of the judges scored it a draw, 28-28. And then the other two scored it 29-27 for Hamzat. Honestly, I thought Hamzat won all three rounds. I thought it should have been 30-26. But I guess giving Kamaru the second round isn't the worst thing in the world. Hamzat definitely won the first, and he definitely won the third. Um, He won the first 10-8 on all three judges' cards. He's the first person to ever secure a 10-8 against Usman. He took Usman down four times in this fight, okay? The only people to ever take Kamaru down before were Leon Edwards and Colby Covington, who each took him down just once. Like, Leon Edwards spent over an hour in the cage with Kamaru Usman through their three fights. And Colby spent 50 minutes in the cage with him. Hamza doubled up on both of their attempts. Hamza doubled up on both of their takedowns and did it in a mere 15 minutes. Okay. That was incredibly impressive. But the judge that scored at 28-28, how in God's name do you score that a draw? How in the hell do you give Usman the second and third rounds of that fight? Maybe the second. Maybe. Not the third. Like, are you, what the fuck are you watching? I'm at least glad that the right person won. So that's good. Palms out is 13-0. Usman, on the other hand, has now dropped his last three straight fights. And... People were calling him the best welterweight of all time going into this fight. I'm actually really glad he lost this fight. You want to know why? Because Georgia St. Pierre is the best welterweight ever. I can't believe people keep passing him up. As soon as Tyron Woodley had a couple title defenses, most of which sucked, he had two title defenses, okay? And one was a draw. So he retained the belt once, defended it twice. People were saying he was better than GSP. He goes on a severe losing streak. I think he lost four straight, then left. Yeah, four straight. And then he left the UFC and went 0-2 in boxing. Now Kamaru Usman has dropped three straight. Georgia St. Pierre never went on a losing streak. When he went up to 185 pounds, he won the belt. Now Kamaru goes up to 185 pounds, and he's 0-1 in the division. Georgia St. Pierre is the best welterweight ever. Him against any of the top, top guys now, I still think he beats all of them. I really do. He was so far ahead of his time. He outboxed the best boxers like Nick Diaz, like BJ Penn. He outwrestled the best wrestlers like John Fitch and Josh Koscheck easily. He's like the best athlete in the sports history. He had the best, most educated jab in the sports history. Oh, yeah. Jake Shields also outwrestled him. GSP beat everyone with the very basics of the sport. Do you have any idea how skilled you have to be to beat? everyone all the best with the basics okay he's 26 and 2 as a pro avenged his only two losses the one to the better fighter of which he avenged twice it's about time we start remembering how great georgia st pierre really was not to mention kamaru got five title defenses gsp had nine he won his last 11 straight title fights there's not much of a comparison and also a lot of the guys GSP beat would still be top five, if not top ten guys today. Fucking Johnny Hendricks in his prime, a dangerous, dangerous dude. Josh Koscheck, one of the best wrestlers in the sports history. Like, GSP, a lot of his opponents would still be top, top guys today. Nick Diaz would be a top ten guy. Carlos Condit would probably be a top ten guy, though he never learned how to wrestle, and I don't think he would be top five. I do believe he would be a top 10 guy. Um, yeah. 
just wanted to get that out there. And then in the main event of the evening, I was actually pretty worried for Islam in this fight because he was preparing for a much different opponent, even though he'd already fought Volkanovski. And man, he shut that down. Like Islam ended two of the most impressive win streaks in the sport's history over the course of his last three fights. Charles Oliveira had won his last 11 straight with 10 finishes going into their fight. The only fight he couldn't finish was against Tony Ferguson. If he had five seconds left in that first round, he would have broke Tony's arm. Okay. So 11 and 0 in his last 11 fights with 10 finishes. Islam drops him on the feet and submits him. The most accomplished submission fighter in UFC history. He submitted in the second round. And then earlier this year in February, he snapped Volkanovski's 22 fight win streak. He was 12 and 0 in the UFC, and on a 22 fight win streak, he ended it. Now, a lot of people wanted to see this rematch, and it was billed as the most anticipated rematch in UFC history because of how the first fight went. Now, I thought Islam won that first fight 49 46, but what I will say. Even though I scored all four of the first rounds for him, they were all very competitive and they were all very close. And then he definitively lost the fifth round, which made a lot of people think Volkanovski was the guy to beat him. Islam shut that down quickly last night. He landed a beautiful head kick and followed it up with some ground and pound for the knockout victory at 306 of round one. Max Holloway landed that same kick on Volkanovski in their rematch and dropped him to a knee momentarily with it, but he couldn't get the finish. Islam did. Islam striking has gotten so fucking good lately. Man. So Volkanovski is now 26-3, and three, only lost to Islam inside the UFC, and he's still undefeated at featherweight. And Islam is now 25-1 and one as a pro. And I believe he's on a 13-fight win streak now. Yep, 13 fights. 13-fight win streak. It's insane. Since coming back in 2021 after a near two-year absence, Islam has gone 7-0 and with six finishes. The only guy he couldn't finish, he finished in his immediate rematch with him. It's his second uh, title defense at lightweight. He wants to go up to 170 pounds soon because he's running out of names to face at 155. But really, he's only beat, he's only fought and beat two top 10 guys at lightweight, Charles Oliveira and Armin Saryukin. Like, they're still Gamrot. They're still Gagey. All of the Oliveira rematch, I'm not going to argue with because Oliveira just knocked out Benil Dariush in the first round, who was on an eight fight win streak going into that fight. So the question is who does Islam Makachev fight next? First off, he better stay at 155 because his only title defense is at 155. He's got two of them, as I just mentioned. Both of them are over the featherweight champion. So I think there are two clear names that could be next. Charles Oliveira or Justin Gagey. Charles Oliveira, he already fought and already beat. Justin Gagey is a new face and probably a more compelling fight at this point. But Gagey lost to Oliveira in their fight. So I would be happy with either, but I really want to see Islam fight Gagey. I think Gagey deserves a title shot. They're both coming off head kick knockout wins. Um, Gagey just knocked out Poirier with a head kick a couple months ago. Um, the first head kick knockout of his career, actually. It was actually the first and second time I'd ever seen him throw a head kick. So he threw it in the first round. He didn't quite land it. Threw it in the second round, landed, and knocked him out with it. So Gagey is still evolving, as is Islam, as we just saw last night and in his first fight with uh, Volkanovski. So I'd like to see him fight Gagey, but if they make the Oliveira rematch, I'm not going to be too upset. If they make the Mateos Gamrot fight, I'm not going to be too upset. Um, ideally, Gamrot would get one more win, especially coming off a split decision over Jalen Turner and then an injury TKO over Rafael Fiziev. Um but yeah, who do you guys want to see Islam Makachev defend his belt against next? I think that'll about do it for this UFC 294 recap. If you like the video, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. And uh, have a good one. See you on the next one.